Robots rely on sensors to understand their surroundings. Compared with traditional sensing modalities like LiDAR, cameras provide richer information about the scene while being small, lightweight, inexpensive, and power efficient. Extracting this information can be challenging, but with advances in computer vision, cameras are becoming ubiquitous on robots, including self-driving vehicles. Indeed, the only way that a DuckyBot perceives its surroundings is through its forward-facing camera, which the DuckyBot uses to figure out where it is relative to the lane and to detect pedestrians and other DuckyBots. In order to reason about a robot's three-dimensional world from two-dimensional images, we first need to understand how cameras produce these images. At a fundamental level, cameras just image the scene by recording light waves that reflect off objects in the environment. For most of their history, cameras have measured light using photographic film, typically made up of layers of light-sensitive crystals that change their structure in proportion to the amount of light that they absorb. Modern-day digital cameras, like those on the DuckyBot, replace photographic film with an array of analog sensors that convert photons of light into electron charges that, together, give rise to an image. Like any camera, digital or film, the camera on the DuckyBot images the scene by measuring light. Incident light, such as that emitted by the sun, reflects off objects in the scene and then strikes the camera sensor, where it is recorded. In order to model the process by which the 3D world is mapped to 2D images, we need to understand the behavior of reflected light. Let's start by treating our sensor as a one-dimensional array of photoreceptors, each of which records the light waves that strike it. Ideally, each point in the scene would reflect one light ray, and that light ray would hit a unique photoreceptor. We can then convert the light intensity recorded at each receptor into an image of the scene. Unfortunately, light reflection is far more complex and depends on a variety of factors, including the object's geometry and its surface material. Suppose that we zoom in on a particular point in the scene where we use a vector to indicate the surface normal. Incident light reaching this point reflects in one of two ways. The first type is specular reflection. The mirror-like reflection whereby light reflects off the surface at an angle relative to the surface normal that is equal to that of the incident light ray. The second type is diffuse reflection, in which the incident light ray is scattered at many different angles. If you look around you, the vast majority of the objects that you see are observed as a result of diffuse reflection. It should come as no surprise, then, that the same is true of cameras. Returning to our simple one-dimensional camera, the effect of specular and diffuse reflection is that each point in the sensor plane will receive light from different points on the object. This makes it essentially impossible to determine how individual points in the scene contributed to the recorded intensities. The result is a washed out image of the objects in the scene. If we want an image that accurately captures the content of the scene, we need to control which rays of light impact the sensor. In the extreme case, we can encase the sensor in a lightproof box that blocks all specular and diffuse light from reaching the sensor. Of course, this isn't terribly useful as a camera. Now we will create a small aperture in the enclosure. This pinhole allows a small amount of light reflecting off the object to pass through and reach the sensor while still blocking most of the rays. A limited amount of light reflecting off other points on the object also pass through the pinhole, with each ray striking a different location or pixel on the sensor. The single point that all rays pass through is called the center of projection, or the camera center. The projection through the pinhole results in an inverted image of the scene. Of course, this is an overly simplified view of how a camera works. By making the aperture so small, we have, by design, blocked most of the light from reaching the sensor, which results in an underexposed image and low signal-to-noise ratio. We can increase the signal-to-noise ratio by enlarging the aperture, which will allow more light to reach the sensor. However, this will reduce the sharpness of the image. Instead, cameras use lenses to direct more light onto the sensor, increasing the exposure while also preserving the sharpness of the image. This process by which light passes through the aperture to form an image has been known for centuries. First described in the 4th century BCE, the camera obscura, which is Latin for dark chamber, is a dark room with a small hole or lens on one end. Light passing through the hole is projected onto the opposite wall. The first picture appeared in 1545, when the Dutch physician Gemma Frisius published a book in which he described how he used the camera obscura to watch a solar eclipse. By that time, the geometric principles underlying the projection were already well known. Perhaps not surprisingly, some of this understanding owes to Leonardo da Vinci who used the camera obscura to study optics and human vision. In 1490, he described the workings of the camera obscura as a drawing aid for artists, though this work wasn't known until his writings were discovered more than 300 years later. In the remainder of the lecture, we are going to derive the model that describes how 3D scene points are projected onto the 2D image plane through a transformation referred to as perspective projection. In doing so, we will consider a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate frame located at the camera center with the positive z-axis pointed out of the camera. This axis is orthogonal to the image plane and is referred to as the principal axis. 
Let's treat the image plane as being in front of rather than behind the camera center. The math will be the same, and this way we don't have to worry about dealing with inverted images. We will associate a 2D coordinate frame with the image, with its origin at the principal point. Before we drive the full perspective projection model, let's look at a simpler setting, in which we project a two-dimensional scene point onto a one-dimensional image. In this case, we have two similar right-angle triangles that share a vertex at the camera center C. The larger of the two has an adjacent side of length Z and an opposite side of height Y. The other triangle has an adjacent side of length F, which is the focal length of the camera. By properties of similar triangles, the coordinate of the projected point on the image is given by F times Y divided by Z. Note that the distance of this projected point from the image center increases with the focal length and decreases as the distance of the scene point along the principal axis increases. In other words, small objects close to the camera can have a projection with the same height as larger objects farther from the center. These properties also hold for 3D to 2D perspective projection. In order to derive the mathematical expression that describes how points in the world are projected onto the image, it will be helpful to represent the points in homogeneous coordinates. Consider a line L in a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate frame. The line is represented by three parameters, A, B, and C, that specify its slope and intercept. Any point x and y on the line must satisfy the equation A times x plus B times y plus C equals zero. We can write this equation as an inner product between the vector of parameters L and a three-vector representation of the point, where we append a one at the end. We can multiply both sides of this equation by any non-zero constant k without changing the expression for the line. Any point that lies on the line defined by the vector L also lies on the line defined by the vector k times L because they're the same line. The parameters and in turn the line are invariant to multiplication by any non-zero value. Similarly, we can multiply the three vector representation of the point by a non-zero constant and the result will still lie on the line. In fact, for any non-zero scalar k, the three vector kx, ky, k represents the same point x, y. This three-vector representation of two-dimensional Cartesian coordinates is referred to as homogeneous coordinates, or projective coordinates, because of the utility in projective geometry. Similarly, the homogeneous coordinates of a 3D point are given by the scale invariant 4-vector that follows by appending a 1 to the vector of Cartesian coordinates. If we multiply the resulting vector by any non-zero constant, the corresponding Cartesian coordinates remain unchanged. Returning to our pinhole camera model, if we represent points in homogeneous coordinates, we can express the projection operation as a matrix multiplied by the homogeneous coordinates of the 3D point in the camera's reference frame. This matrix P is referred to as the camera projection matrix. In order to convert the resulting point in the image to its Cartesian coordinates, we divide by Z, the distance from the optical center, giving the same coordinates that we get using properties of similar triangles. Thus far, we have assumed that the principal point was the origin of the image coordinate frame. However, the origin is typically located elsewhere on the image plane. We can update our model to accommodate this by translating the coordinates of the principal point. This gives rise to a modified form of the camera projection matrix where we include this translation. We can express this projection operation as a matrix K multiplied by a matrix that concatenates a 3x3 three three identity matrix with a 3-vector column of zeros. The matrix K is referred to as the camera calibration matrix, or the intrinsic matrix. As the name suggests, it is defined in terms of parameters of the camera. In this case, these include the focal length and the coordinates of the principal point on the image. The more general versions exist. We now have an expression that describes the transformation of 3D points in the camera frame to their 2D projection on the image. Suppose now that the coordinates of the 3D points are specified with respect to a world coordinate frame, and the camera's coordinate frame is defined relative to the world frame by a rotation matrix R and translation vector T. The rotation matrix and translation vector allow us to transform the Cartesian coordinates of a point in the world frame into the camera's coordinate frame. Here, we are using tildes to denote points expressed in Cartesian or non-homogeneous coordinates. Returning to our expression for the projective transformation, we can now define the projection in terms of points expressed relative to the world coordinate frame. The result is the standard perspective projection model for pinhole cameras. Looking more closely at this expression, perspective projection is expressed as a product of two matrices, one of which is a function of the camera's intrinsic parameters, and the second defined by the camera's pose relative to the world frame. The product of these two matrices gives rise to the camera projection matrix P that associates the homogeneous coordinates of 3D points in the scene to the homogeneous coordinates of their corresponding points in the two-dimensional image plane. 
Now that we have a model of perspective projection, which describes how pinhole cameras produce an image of the scene, we can begin to think about how we might reason over these images to understand the robot's surroundings. Before we do that, though, we first have to identify the parameters that define this projection model, a problem we will discuss next. <laughs> 